They say that the human race is doomed, that we have lost touch with our true nature, that the media has corrupted us, and that the planet has no future. I disagree. I believe that humanity is full of hope and that our salvation lies within each one of us. My name is Brian Rose and my job is to listen, the oldest method of learning known to man. Each week I seek out individuals that are changing the world, people who are living and thinking in a different way. Their stories will challenge your beliefs, make you question your choices, and perhaps inspire you to change. I never planned on doing any of this, but now I can't stop. Join me on this mission and make humanity something we can all be proud of. This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Grant Cardone, the New York Times bestselling author, sales training expert, and motivational speaker on leadership, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, and social media. Originally from Louisiana, you started from nothing and now have five privately held companies with annual revenues exceeding 100 million. Last year, Forbes Magazine named you number one of the 25 marketing influencers to watch, and you're the author of five books, including Sell or Be Sold, The 10X Rule, and if you're not first, you're last, Grant, Welcome to London Real. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to have you here. It's great to be in this room, man. Hey, hey thank you very much. How is London treating you? What in do you London, think of this city? Well, in London's treating us as well as we treat it, except for the casino, which I, I lost 500 pounds pretty quick. But um, it's been great, man. We've been to Harrods and staying down in a nice, nice little spot. So the hotel's nice. The people are great. I uh, haven't seen Harry yet, but I've been trying to find him on the streets. Yeah, I heard you you're pointing him out at Buckingham Palace. And people went for it every they time. They did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just started screaming out of my car, Harry, there's Harry, Harry sighting. Right. My driver just lost it. And uh, he's getting married this weekend, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you're stirring it up a little bit. Your yeah. girls were on London, uh, Tower Bridge, yeah. right? Tower Bridge. So they called it London Bridge, but it was Tower Bridge. I, I, I don't know where I am most of the time, so. Yeah. I think when they sold the old London Bridge to the Americans in Arizona, they thought it was the Tower Bridge. Okay. That's the pretty one. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're liking it here. We're loving it. Okay. I mean, the weather's been spectacular, so. Been great. People what? are phenomenal. Really? Yeah. Friendly. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe we're friendly. Okay. You know, and, they, and then they respond in kind. When you think of London, when you're in Miami, like, what do you usually think about British, European? Is it a different mentality yeah, than the I Americans? Think, yeah. I think. I think conservative, polite manners, proper, all the things that I'm basically not. <laughs> you know that that I even wonder, wow, will I fit in there? You know, will they? You know, will they accept who I am? And but, but I've had the same problem in it, where I live, like, like those things, those social, you know, expectations of, not that I don't have manners, but, but the, the social norms, like fitting into something, you know, my whole life I've struggled with fitting in. And so, you know, living there and coming here, this is just like manners on steroids here, proper on steroids, right? Like, the, the, you have to be proper, <laughs> right? A gentleman. <laughs> And were you always that way, just open book when it comes to your feelings and telling people what you thought? I, I mean, look, look, my dad died when I was 10, so when you don't have a father, a, a, a male image there to, like, you know, drop the belt, because my dad was an enforcer. And um, I think it changes things. You know, my mom, I, I remember after my dad died, my mom whipped me. She brought out the belt, and it was a joke. It was like, this is hilarious. You're like, I'll never be whipped again, right? So, um you know, I was without direction, and, and, and um, you know, I, I missed that, that guy directing me, and be, being that mentor and, and uh, that strong, you know, and then I had my mom just scared and trying to figure things out. So you got a 10-year-old kid, man, a uh, twin brother. So I, I had a force. We, we were a unit. Um, we're bored. School didn't help because we're bored. And you... You were born in Lake Charles, yeah, Louisiana. Yeah, little small town, yeah. What, what, what is that like for people that have never been to Louisiana, that don't know what, what yeah. it's like down there? How would you explain it to uh, Prince Harry? You know, what, what's well, the culture well, like? What are the people I'd like? I'd say, Harry, dude, dude, like I took a, can a canoe, a little canoe down the bayous, you know, to go to school, yeah. you know, and he took a carriage. So, um, 
No, it's a little small town. You know, it's it's hot. It's it's humid. Uh, mosquitoes, roaches, like. Uh, I grew up low, low, you know, middle class. I mean, we had we had a roof and we had air conditioning, we had heater and and we had a car and we had bicycles, but we had fear. There was tremendous fear in the environment, constant fear, worry about. And, and this wasn't for a cycle. This was for, you know, from the age of ten to, like when I left the house. Okay. Constant fear the whole time. Fear of economics. Economic fear. Yeah, okay. It was, all, it was all economics. The mechanics going to take care, take advantage of us. The plumber's gonna take advantage of us. The roofer, like anything, you didn't wanna spend money. Everything was conservation. It, it really has built who I am today. Okay. Because, um, you know, the, the, my dad died in February. My mom sold the house by March. So we had this beautiful house. My dad had finally made it fully into the middle class, maybe even upper middle class. 18 months after he bought his house, his dream house, uh, he died. 15 days later, the house is sold because she couldn't handle it. So at 10 years old, I'm learning a house is a liability. I, I didn't know this would play out later, right? Yeah. But later on in my life, I would realize um, it would be another 20 years and I'd realize, oh, a single family home, the front door, just one door house is not an asset, it's a liability. Okay, and I wanna talk on that definitely. Yeah, yeah. Is that, that money, fear, economic kind of prison in your brains, is that endemic to Louisiana, the South, America? To all of America. Okay, living yeah. on the edge, paycheck to paycheck. Amer America, America. you know, the movies act like Amer all the Americans are rich and they're all boisterous and they're all secure. Completely not true. Any more than all English people are, have manners. So um, the Americans are, 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. 64% of Americans that have businesses break even or lose money. Uh, the, the land of the brave and the home of the free, that's our American uh, anthem. Um, it, it's not even close to the truth. Mo most people are, don't have any money and have, have accepted the fact that they don't have any money. They don't have any leftover money. They're fearful of money constantly. They overspend. They don't know how to produce money. They definitely don't know how to multiply it. Might be a world condition. Because, mm. you know, what everybody's been telling me here is like, do you, you're, I said, what country am I describing? Uh, right here. Yeah. Do you think the American kind of brashness comes from that underlying fear? No, I think that comes from the movies. Mo most Americans are not brash. Okay. You know, I would be, I would be my persona, which is like who I, 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 I I've just figured out how to get away with it. Um, mo mo most Americans are not brash by any means. Okay. So even you're an outlier in Miami? Oh, no, without a doubt. Okay. Tell me more about young Grant. So you're 10. Yeah. You know, your dad had just made it, I think at nine, he had bought the house, right? Yeah, and then you right. died at 10. Yeah. You had a twin brother who, I mean, I know you said you've always kind of, he was a way for you to look at yourself. Uh -huh. And you were like, wow, I see so much potential in him. And so it's a way that you kind of got to look at yourself. Yeah. And, and tell me about that young kid. Uh, you know, just again, like my mom had her hands full. You know, she didn't talk about money being a problem, but we could see, I could see that she was scared. She's clipping coupons. It's the culture, yeah. right? You're, you're being boiled, you're being made ready in a soup. The culture is the soup. And you're being cooked in the soup, and that's where we're collecting our data from. And uh, so the, the information was, you know, save your money. A penny saved is, you know, penny earned. And, and everything's preservation and conservation and, and you know, protection and conservation. and Which is like, BS, because it's passive. Well, totally, totally. You're just becoming a victim. You're becoming a, you're, you're sitting back, you're, you're effect of everything. So there was, but my mama, did, she didn't know any better, right? She was, a, she was uneducated. She had never held a job. She, had, she did not have an entrepreneurial spirit. Like she, doesn't, she didn't know at that time women really weren't encouraged to go out and earn money. So they were, mothers were doing at that time in the 50s what they did. They were raising kids and being a wife right. and taking care of the house, which, by the way, is an extremely important role and probably something that we're short on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but she, was do, she was giving me three meals a day, and with every meal came a lecture, you know. So um, she was just doing the best she could do. I, on the other hand, at 10 years old, wanted to be a man. At 12, I wanted to be an adult. 
I wanted to be an adult since I was six. When I saw that whoever had the money decided where we went, I wanted money. I didn't want money because I because of money. I wanted money because who, it appeared to me that whoever had the money had control of the environment. Mm -hmm. And I knew that way before my dad died. I would watch him and another man, a, do a doctor in the neighborhood, and they seemed to have fun. Whoever had the money seemed to like control where we went, how long we went, what we did. And the kid, the kid, if you, if you have kids, you, how many you have? I got two young boys and then a stepdaughter in her yeah. teens. They're picking up everything. Oh yeah, it's like a hard drive that just opens when they are born. You know exactly. You know, and and they're open to learning, and and um, you know I can watch my kids. They'll play on a phone. They could watch a TV show and know exactly what me and what Elaine and I are talking about in the other room, and collect all the data perfectly. But it, when you take an adult and put them in that setting, and they're like, "Hey, wait a minute, I can't. I I got to pay attention to this." But the kid doesn't do that. The kid's like, "I can consume here. I can consume off the game." and I can pick up your, your conversation and duplicate almost all of it perfectly. Okay, and so what? As and I was doing the same thing. Okay, all right. I'm picking up everything from my brother, my older brother, my twin brother, my mom, TV, John Kennedy gets killed. I'm, I'm picking up data everywhere. My, my, my dad dies. I'm picking up all the data, right? And, and, and that's what makes, that, that's what like starts forming the character of the individual. My dad wanted to be rich. He never said that to me, but Later, I would find out my dad wanted to be a wealthy man, and he didn't get there. He got, he did, he fulfilled his oblig personal obligation as a man to take care of his family, and his wife, and his kids, and be a good example to his parents. He didn't get the freedom part, you know, which he really wanted, and I think some of that might have been left in the environment for me to grab. Is that why you're doing what you're doing now? I don't. Th I don't think that's why I'm doing it, but but certainly that was a, it was an inspiration. Okay, to kind of get there, where he wanted to go. Maybe. 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 You know, my brother's got it. Okay. In a different way, though. In my my brother and I do money completely different. Okay. He's much more free willy with it, and I'm much more okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this into something and not take as many risks. But I had two sisters and an older brother in the environment. My older brother died when he was very young. My two older sisters, they didn't get it as much in the same environment. So you can't just say it's an environmental thing. Talk to me about the teenage grant. Yeah. You're doing lemonade stands and uh, paper roots. No, I'm doing drugs is what I'm doing. <laughs> 15, what? Uh, 16 years old, I, I smoke weed for the first time. Louisiana, you're not doing lemonade stands, man. It's a great conversation. Selling baseball cards and selling flowers. and But that's not what we were doing. We were, we were in Louisiana. We're shooting guns. Anything that moves, we shoot it. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I have a rifle. 22 caliber rifle at 12 years old. We're wild, man. Okay. Wild kids. That's We're having mud wars in the lake and kumquat battles with the neighbors and smashing eggplants in the cars. Like, we're bored. Like, we, we have the worst problem in society, boredom. Still a problem there. Today? Oh, for everybody, not just me. Okay. But this is my projection on all of mankind, but... yeah. When people are bored, they become problematic. Okay, and you times 10. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, and so, so we smoke some weed at 16, Yeah, and yeah. that's the start of a, of a road. Yeah. And what, what, why do you think that was so attractive to you? It was not attractive. Okay. No, it was, it, I knew when I picked it up, I'm like, this is, a, this is terrible, I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I know I'm gonna regret doing this. But you know, my brother was doing it, Brian, my buddy, was doing it. I wanted in. The peer pressure was very powerful. Um, you know, how do you go it alone here? So smoked weed. Next day I smoked it again. Next thing you know, I'm like full into drugs. And no, but nobody, nobody starts using drugs thinking I'm going to be a drug addict. But within probably two years, I was doing drugs every day. Okay, not just weed, other stuff. Anything. Okay. But this is before the whole pill crisis down south, so it wasn't necessarily that. What was no, happening. no, no. This was way before the... The, the opiate. Right. Yeah. Because no, no. that would have been really yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Okay. But and this was dangerous enough. Okay. So he, Why for be, you? Because, because, I mean, I became a full-fledged, like, drug addict. Okay. And um, I'm, smoke, I'm smoking, popping pills, any drug. There was no, like, everybody, like, what's your drug of choice? Did, like, any drug. Alcohol. Alcohol. Anything that, would, anything that would change my attitude or fill up the boredom. 
is it boredom or just maybe the negativity and fear and uncertainty of the area or of your life? Or? Like, yeah, sure, all that, you know, okay. like, like, you know, the, the rehab I went to said that you have a disease, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't believe that today, that, that some people have a disease. I, there's no test for the disease anyway, like, there's diseases now for everything that, that they have no test for, so I don't think it's a disease or I was somehow picked to be a drug addict or I have some DNA to be an entrepreneur or me and Gary Vee had this conversation. He thinks, he thinks entrepreneurs have some DNA. I said, that's, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. That means some people can't be entrepreneurs. Which is not true. No, you do drugs enough, it won't matter what your DNA is. Right. You do anything enough. You go into a casino enough times and play enough times, you'll become addicted, like, just like a game. Like you play a game enough times, enough levels of Candy Crush, and you'll wanna, you'll wanna get to the next level. So, and that's what happened with drugs. It was 15 years old to 25 for 10 years, some nine and a half years, I used drugs almost every day. It's heavy. Yeah, it was terrible, man. It was terrible. The, drug, the drugs are one thing, but the degraded, the degradedness of the individual. It chips away at your self-esteem little by little by little, right? And then by chunks, and then by big, big blocks. So by the time I'm 20, by the time I'm 19, I was like, I was as close to zero as a person can get. Like and I'll go lower than that before it's over. Okay. And yeah, you said that you thought your low was much higher than it really was, yeah, right? Yeah, You thought your rock bottom there's was a lot, higher. There's a lot of rock bottoms. Okay. You know. If I had met Grant then, like what would he be like? No eye contact, just real, not even there? Uh, I weigh 170 pounds today. I weighed 130 pounds then. Okay. Gray, very gray. Um, my nose is damaged from the inside. Uh, you know, like it was, it was ugly, dude. It was bad, okay. Yeah. And when you're 20, your older brother dies. Yeah, when I was 20, I mean, you, you, man, you did the research. Well, you know, so. I like to know what's going on. So, yeah, uh, so and that doesn't help anything, right? That well, should, my dad died when I was 10. Yeah. So, like, oh, oh, I'm thinking, man, life is short here. Um, my brother dies 10 years later. I talked to him the night before. On a Sunday night, I talked to him. Monday morning, he was dead. So that gets reinforced, you know, and... John Kennedy died in between. No, no, he died before my dad. So all these messages, you're getting punched. Like even John Kennedy's death, right? It's a big deal, right? I don't think people yeah, understand. I was five years old, man. I'm five years old. I'm in a house. I don't even know what I'm watching. I just know that there's grief in my house, on TV. Like there was grief in the entire nation, probably in, th in the whole world. Yeah. You, you feel this event happening, yeah. you know? And, and the, the, there are these events that happen that, that shift people's that are so powerful and so big, and I'm starting to have these, and they're being re-stimulated as time goes on, right? They're being, they're, they're mounting on top of one another, right. and they're, 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 they're punching in a message. Which, yeah. which, by the way, there's, there's a, there's some goodness that yeah. comes out of that which because means the time is now. Yeah, exactly. Time is now. Be in a hurry, and also, dude, if you punch on anything long enough, you could actually change things. Like my life is about punching. I'm a puncher, like I punch a lot, I punch hard, and, but mostly I punch persistently, kind of like life did to me. Like I lo I've learned to punch back. Is that like banging your head against the wall until the wall breaks? Yeah, the wall breaks. The okay. wall will break. Yeah, like your head will get bloody. Yeah, well, the, wife, the woman I'm married to, she's like she just broke. She's just finally like, okay, <laughs> maybe you're a good dude. 13 months later, Yeah, yeah. she said yes. Um, so just back to that piece. So, yeah. And then the downside of having all that death reminder in your life is that maybe I just want to take this pain away and get into the drugs to take away, get away from yeah, the world. I, I, I don't, not. I don't think it was pain driven. Like, okay. like, oh, you know, that's what they told, you know, oh, you lost your dad, your dad abandoned you. You know, I've had all the therapy around all that. I don't think, I think those guys are just a little bit off okay. from, from, um, I did not have to go down that path to find who I am. That guy was always there. You know, the guy I am today was always there. You could not kill him with drugs. And, and, you know, now coming out of the treatment center, they tried to get rid of that guy. That guy is the guy, you know, the guy, the obsessed guy, the, the, you know, the guy that can throw himself all into something, the drug addict. Yeah. Do you want that guy? You want that guy because that's the guy that makes things happen. That guy is relentless. Right. You want that. You okay. want that. But rehab wants to get rid of that what guy. You, they want to keep you yeah, in fear he, a little they, bit. They think that guy's the problem. That guy's not the problem. The drugs were the problem. Okay. Okay. The lack of self-esteem was the problem. 
the the boredom was the problem, dude. I'll talk about boredom. Like, boredom is the drug you need to avoid. Because that's where people start making bad choices. Typically, they don't become a drug addict. They become a consumer of garbage. Right. They waste time. They consume excuses. You know, so that happened here. I see that here a lot. Okay, in this city? Or, yeah, okay. in this country. Oh, in this country, okay. Yeah. Uh, what was the rock bottom that got you into that rehab? My mom. They, they, it wasn't the drugs. It wasn't. I was beat up. I had seventy stitches put in my head and face with a with a guy beat pistol whip me. What was the? Why was that happening? Because you talked about that incident before. Blood because all I around. I told another dude. This guy said something to me, and I said something to him, and he sent a boy, you know, to teach me a lesson. So, Louisiana style. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With a gun and yeah, yeah. Because okay. you still got scars from that. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. Totally. Here, here, above both of my eyes, underneath the eyes, over my mouth, and um, you know, they, they they wanted to disfigure me. Just imagine how handsome I would have been just without that. <laughs> Did that event help you? No, no, no. That just beat beat, beat up the self esteem even more. Okay. It like it, it degraded me another level because now like you can't even stand up for yourself, dude. You won't even fight back, which I did, but that just. <laughs> You know, the guy was a lot bigger than me. So um, <clears throat> now I'm in a space where there's criminals and gangsters and real physical harm. I don't know how to get out of this space, and I don't know how to play by those rules because I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy that will beat up somebody, you know. I'll, 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 you know, I'll do what I can to protect myself, but I won't play that level. So now I'm in a terrible place. Because I can't win in this space. So I'm 23. I'm in the hospital. I'm, like, I'm going to quit drugs now. I was doing drugs before the day was over. I couldn't stop, man. Yeah. So two years would go by. I continued my behavior. You would think this would be the one, right? And uh, my mom, you know, I, I, my mom had this little business going on. She was trying to run this little business. And I walked in. I was all sloppy, loaded. And she's like, I'm done. Don't come here anymore. You're not welcomed here anymore. This might be the last time we see each other. And I was in a treatment center 30, 30 days later. Hmm. Yeah. This is the most powerful things, relationships, right? Yeah, man. Get tough to love, man. Something. My mom yeah. said, hey, I'm that done. That was it. She had enough she of meant your nonsense. It too. Okay. And you yeah. knew she meant it. So you I, look, I was disgusted. I needed something. I need yeah. I needed one more thing to just like, okay, one way or the other. I was dying. I'd been dying for nine years. My mom just turned her, she turned her eye to it. She, she, she didn't want to, she didn't want to confront it. If you're the mother of a drug addict, you know. You know before he knows. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I'm doing this whole Ironman race and I, and I came open about my own um, heroin overdose in, o, in 01. Uh -huh. So I, I know what you're talking about, you know, and yeah. everyone knows it around you. Yeah. And the only thing that made me hit rock bottom was that everyone abandoned me. Uh -huh. And um, I went and saw a bunch of them in New York recently, the first time in 16 years, and I'm like, thank you. Because if you hadn't have told yeah, me, yeah, yeah. they basically say, fuck you yeah. by getting out of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it shows you that it's no longer accessible, yeah. acceptable. Yeah, yeah. And that's the only thing that would make me Yeah, do when it. your drug dealer tells you you have a problem, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, that's a problem, too. Yeah, but, yeah. like, you know, waking up in a hospital almost dead doesn't do it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like something else no, is right. a trigger. And so rehab did teach you some things. And dude, I wanted to recover. It's not like yeah. I, I, did, I didn't want to do it. I, I had tried to quit. You, you know the deal. T at least 10 times a day, I quit drugs for nine years. Today, I'm going to quit. Five minutes later, I'm using. And then I'd say, okay, I'm going to quit. That's it. I'm done. I'm not going to throw it away yet, but I'm done. And then an hour and a half later, dude, I'm doing drugs again. So every day, it's not just the drugs. It's not just what you're doing to your body. It's like the number of times I quit and couldn't quit, right? And then started again. Like, you know, it's just like you start like losing any sense of self-respect. Right. right. Yeah. And so how do you get that back? You go to rehab. I go to rehab. And they teach you about maybe how to mentally to deal with staying away from the drugs. But not really, not no. really, man. Okay. I, I wonder if the treatment centers aren't just... You know, just adding to the problem. How so? Well, I mean, I know I know the intention's good, but most of them today are producing a different kind of drug addict. You know, they're going. I'm, I'm going in on some, you know, 
one drug and coming out on phenobarbital. But I mean, they, they, got, right. they gave me drugs while I was there. Okay. They said, don't not take these. You need this drug. Right. You are a drug addict. You will never recover. It is a disease. You have it. You cannot recover from it no matter what. Uh, give up all your ideas. You, you know the whole inventory thing. You do the inventory. Mm. And, and, and you told them, no, you're wrong. Yeah, he, he's like, man, give up. He's like, you'll never make it. He's like, your yeah. chance of making it. I said, oh, really? Why am I going to fail? He's like, and I had 28 days now. I'm like, shit, dude, I just quit using drugs for 28 days. So really all I needed. Right? I needed to know I could not. I could go some period of time without using drugs. So he... Uh, and that was it? No relapse after that? There's never been a relapse. That's crazy. So he said, he said uh, if you do, if you hold on to these ideas of the books and being, a, being famous and getting rich and all the stuff that I told him was underneath all this that I'd been covering up, right? Uh, you'll never make it. Be satisfied. I, I, I can't, you know, I just, it's the echo in my mind of him saying, be satisfied with one thing. Don't use drugs one day at a time. If that's all you get out of life, I'm like, fuck this dude, dude, dude. That will not be what I'm known for. Yeah. And I went to meetings after that and I kept hearing that. But I kept hearing it from people that, were, that, that didn't recover more than just the drug addiction or the alcoholism. The rest of their life never recovered. Because they're playing kind of small and safe and scared. Because every day they're they playing might with go, the just. Okay. Just be sober. Just don't use. Right. And 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 I don't think I was made to just anything. Yeah. Yeah, I I look I I've never been to an AA meeting and I know they do a lot of great things for people, but it always seems in a weird way that you're kind of getting up there and saying, I'm always this addict, I have this disease, and I'm just a win today because I got up here and didn't drink. Yeah. But it's like, well, wait a second. Yeah, <laughs> a win today would be if you went and fucking crushed it. Yeah, exactly. And so, but then they, they want to hold you back because they think that's addiction manifested or that's going to bring you back. Yeah, dude. Oh, oh, I was even told, well, I, you know, because I came back and I started working. I just threw my addiction into work. I needed something to throw into, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, I have to stay busy. Time is my enemy. Time is my problem. When there's too much time, Grant goes freaking nuts. And, and uh, yeah, you're OCD and you're ADD and you're ADHD and you're ADHD and you're, I'm like, yeah, wh where's the test on this shit? Like I can measure certain things. The stuff you guys are talking about, I know how tall I am. I, all this other stuff you guys are talking, sounds like it's made up to me. Subjective. You, it's bullshit. It's also inconclusive. So, so if you are, so what? Yeah. You still need a plan. Like, 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 how about we take some blind tests and see how many different people like, the, the book's are about that thick, okay? Who does it benefit to drug, label me? Drug companies. Totally. Yeah. Like, who, who's on the other end of this? Remember, I came out of that treatment center with, with, with a bottle of pills that they told me I would be on for the rest of my life. I was on them for a day. Threw them away. Now I'm really getting sober because now I don't have any of this in me. Now I get to start making my own decisions, right? So I threw myself completely into my work. I had a job that I hated threw myself into it completely. Now my sponsor, who I had a sponsor, that was good, that was very helpful okay. and very limiting, right? Your mentor can help you and limit you. If they hold you on the leash and that, be careful. Like, what, who's your mentor? Everybody's got one, by the way. Most people have too many. It's not like, it, no, everybody's got one or many. And so mentors can be a problem as, as much as a, a lift. Okay. And so uh, he says, you've just replaced one addiction for another one. I'm like, Fucking, was, does that make you a genius? Like, of course I have, dude. I got to replace this free time with something. I was using drugs 10 hours a day. I better, I have to replace it with some energy, right? I don't want to just go into a void. Well, he was doing three meetings a day. And I'm like, I'm not, I can't do three meetings. Dude, I need to be a productive member of society. I, ha I have potential. Had you been productive before? Yeah, I remember being productive when you asked that question with my dad. I remember being productive with my dad. I was nine years old. My dad taught me how to work. He, ne he never talked about work, but the way he went to work. And then we were in the yard one day, and we were stuffing, uh, we were picking up leaves and, and, and branches and pecans. And I would watch my dad. He, he was like, to me, as a nine-year-old, he looked like an artist. He was, he was coordinated. I wasn't. He was fast. I was slow. He was clean. I was sloppy, right? It's like watching a, watching a great cook in the kitchen. It's like, you know, it's just fluid. She doesn't read. She doesn't have to check. She doesn't slow down. Everything's kept pretty clean. And then there's me, and they're just, it'll taste similar, but 
there's going to be a fucking mess in this place. So he inspired you to that work I could, ethic. I could see that there was potential. Right? And a beauty in it somehow. And, and there was beauty in work. Hmm. I've always loved work, whether it was outside or inside or... Not just because it keeps you busy, because there's some there, beauty there, in it. There's a mastery in it. I think that, that work is a, 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 a gift from God. Speak on that. Yeah. Because most just, people think it's a chore. Yeah. I, I, when I hear people talk about the job, I, I've seen the four-hour work week and the, 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 you know, the idea that you won't work for anyone, that you can't have a job. It just kills me. You don't like the four-hour work week concept because it, it tries disgusting. to engineer you it's, out of doing something. It's disgusting to me. Explain. It is like... It's disgusting that anybody would want to outsource everything. Uh, that, that, dude, I got 168 hours in a week. I think that's what it is. I, I don't know exactly what the number is, but, um, dude, I want to use them all, man. And you want to get your hands dirty and do things that don't scale and to totally. I want do I'll, things you don't want to do. I, absolutely, I, I want to do things I don't want to do. I hear, I hear guys say, I don't do stuff I don't want to do. Who fucking do? Who are you? Like, who's taking care of you then? How arrogant that you wouldn't do something you don't want to do. And nobody successful does things they only do. Well, I, I do shit I want to do, I don't want to do every day. We drove over here 45 minutes. I don't want to fucking sit in the back of the car. I don't care how nice the car is. No. Who wants to sit in traffic for 45 minutes? I do stuff constantly I don't want to do. It doesn't matter what I want to do. You know, what's my purpose? What's my potential? And am I willing to work toward that? So I, an idea that I would work four hours? No, well, th th that's just not real for me. Like, I would not read the book. If you told me, hey, man, I got this opportunity for you to work part-time, I have zero interest. I want to be great at what I'm doing. And I know, I know, without reading any book, I have to dedicate time and energy, effort, and I have to hit. I have to be frequent. You know, I can't, I've never gotten good at anything. It, Everything's taken, it's been a lot of work for me. So everything for me, whether I'm that little uncoordinated kid, it's taken a lot, you know, it's taken me 30 years to find any kind of success or any sense of, okay, I'm starting to find myself. You know, probably two or 3,000 speaking engagements before I felt like I was comfortable on stage. Um, three businesses that were freaking jamming before I said, you know, you might be a, you might actually be a legitimate businessman. You know, now, now we're at seven businesses. We'll do probably 150 million bucks this year. I got, I'll hit a billion dollars in real estate probably before the year's over. I'm just starting to feel like, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm going to make it, you know. By going into all the things you felt insecure at, the things you were not good at, the things you didn't even like to do. Dude, That's like, been your say, modus operandi for the last 30 to, years. To, totally. So like sales. You know, hate, hated sales. People would be shocked to hear you say that. Hated it. Five, I was in five sales jobs. Was a disaster at all of them. Hate it. Absolutely hated it. Um, you're the master of sales. I, I am. <laughs> I embrace the things I hate. Why, why were you bad at it? Why did you hate it? I didn't know, well, I was bad at it because nobody teaches anybody how to be good at sales, you know? So I didn't know how to communicate to people. I didn't know how to shake a hand, didn't know how to build rapport. I'm, I'm, I'm on, honest enough that I'm not going to lie to people. So the stuff I was being taught to do, I didn't like. You know, they ask a question, you ask them a question. Slimy, dude. You know, I, ha I have enough integrity and ethics that when you tell me, okay, we're not manipulating, but don't answer their question. I'm like, well, dude, that's just, that, that is manipulation. And so, that's why I think a lot of people don't like sales because of what's been taught for a hundred years. So the blueprint's outdated. You dude, got there and it, you're like- It was not, it was always wrong. Okay. It was wrong and it's why, I believe it's why salespeople have so, such a high turnover, why so few people want to be called salespeople. I mean, you go through Harrods down there, you can't find a salesperson in the whole joint. <laughs> you think salespeople are ostracized in America. Oh, dude, it's terrible. Here. It's terrible here. I mean, really? We've had books where seller be sold, we had to change some of the language in the book for it to be in bookshelves here. So like the word pressure can't be in there. Persistence can't be in there. Like there's things, you laws you guys actually have here that like. <laughs> go to Europe, it gets one step worse. 
you know, because it's just a whole, I'm ashamed of money and I don't want to talk, you know, uh -huh. we can talk about that too. But so the sales blueprint, you get in, they give it to you. It's not working for you. It doesn't make sense for you. And you're like, I got to, I got to make my own. Well, what happened was, was I was in a sales job. I, I, I got a college, to, I got a college degree in accounting and. Because you thought it would teach you about money and it didn't. Yeah. So, so I, I end up in the sales job. It's the only job I could get. And so I hate it, right? So I'll go to the treatment center. I come back out of the treatment center. I threw myself into it because it's the only thing I had. I, ha I still had so little self-esteem that there was no way I was going to go try to get another job. Yeah. Right? And I was terrified of using drugs again. So I'm like, I went back. The, the place where I was working, they took me back. And I just I threw myself into it. And it's interesting. When you commit to something, little gifts just start automatically showing up. It's a phenomenal thing. It's happened my whole career. When I fully commit, somebody will bring me something. And, and there's resistance along the way and problems along the way. But if you get through those things. Dude, if you just like, like super commit. Okay. And then look, then keep your eyes open. And by the way, the package may come wrapped in a package you, don't, you, you, you weren't thinking about. Hard work. Or like a voice or like a person or, a, 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 you know maybe from a different direction than you thought or an offering where you're like, you read something about this and that's not the thing. Like all throughout my career, it's come in weird kind of ways. And so um, like if you ask for help and, and, and somebody shows up at the door, may, maybe let, invite them in, okay. regardless of what the packaging is or what you've heard about it or whatever. That's really been beneficial to me. Okay, open mind. Keep your ears open. Try but not to... too open. Okay, because you right. don't want everybody's advice, so you'll be mediocre again. You, 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 you'll be Lose your individuality. Confused. Yeah, you, you, you won't even know what to do. If you listen to me and Dave Ramsey, you won't know whether to get debt or, or avoid it. Okay. And you won't do anything, but you'll be very knowledgeable. Right. And, okay. So so I threw my, a guy walks up, he gives me, a, uh, it was a little cassette tape. He's like, hey, I heard this. I thought you might like it. I listened to it. I was like, oh, my God. There's a way to sell stuff. I didn't know there was actually something you could do. I listened to it. I called the 800 number. I said, what else do you have? And the guy said, uh, we got a program for $3,000. This is 25 years ago. So it's like 10 grand, right? Mm -hmm. So I, don't have, I said, I'll call you back. Call my mom. I said, I need to borrow three grand. First money I ever borrowed outside of college. She gave me the three grand um, and it changed my career. Wow. And, and then when I listened to this guy, and then I got these, this set of tapes and I'd watch it. Um, on, on sales and how to be a sales, how to negotiate. I'm like, this is what I'm going to end up doing for a living. I'm going to teach people how to do this. Because there was such a vacancy and a void of it years ago. But what happened was, what I didn't like was some of the trickery in it. What I did was went in over the years and removed the trickery and basically made transparency and the authenticity in sales the way to service people. And now that's become a multi hundred million dollar business for me. But it's still a dirty word for a lot of people. Will that change over time? Uh, it might, the, 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 the whole space might disappear first actually because of the internet. Really? Because everything will be custom and tailored and... Everything's just order it. Really? You know, order, order online. Sales can't die, Grant. Well, so human opinions always need to be yeah, changed yeah. and challenged. I, 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 don't think, sales I don't think it dies like, like you know, the, the strategy of negotiating with people, like I do big deals today, like, you know, I, I used to think a $20,000 deal was a big deal, but no, we, well, I'm working on $200 million deals today. So those deals are probably not going to be done over the internet. They're, they're complicated. They require personalities and people and, and, and anytime you involve people, then you have insecurities and people have superiors to please and then you got egos on the line, and it's the same thing at every level. Which is good, though. That's an opportunity for you. That's an opportunity. Okay, but you're and saying so at that level, like if you're going to negotiate your own deal, LeBron negotiates his own deals. You better know how to sell, or you better better just walk away. The ultimate is just walk away. Somebody else will offer you something else. But most people are, don't have that kind of marketability, right? So it's the everyday guy. I think some of the sales that will go away are the retail stores, like th that kind of selling. Okay, gotcha. Where it used to just be the human touch point. You're, okay. So I we're think it's going to depend it now on a click. Okay. You're still going to touch somebody and they're going to convince you this is the thing to buy or whatever, but 
some of that's going to go away, but you're still going to, the, the most important things in your life, you're still going to want to negotiate, find the right person, negotiate, like your job, you know, or opportunity. I got guys that work for me that are 33 years old, make a million dollars a year. They negotiated the right deal for them, found the right guy. Negotiating isn't always about buying this piece of furniture, right? They negotiated with themselves as well as the marketplace. Hmm. And found a deal that made everybody yeah. win. Five years it took you to get out of rehab and make your first million. Did you get all your self-esteem back? Because I know that mm. takes time. From personal experience, I know it takes no, years. No, no, no. Money, money, in many, money in many situations can actually um, increase the sensitivity to, to the lack of se se uh, self. How so? Because, you know, you would think, first of all, I was so busy working. By the time I was 33, I think I, 31 or 32, something, somewhere in there, one day I looked at him, I'm like, oh, wow, I got a million dollars. You don't make, nobody makes a million dollars, right? You accumulate. Yeah, if you're shooting for a million, you won't get there, right? You accumulate. One day you're like, oh, I got a million dollars in a bank account. That's what makes a millionaire. Everybody's going to everybody's gonna make a million dollars. You make 50 grand a year for 20 years, you, you made a million dollars. You know, but accumulating a million dollars. Now I got a million dollars, I'm like, damn, this is nothing which is like terrifying. There's a line in Wall Street where Bud Fox says, I never knew how poor I was until I started making a little bit of money. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, I remember I, I made, I, one year I made 650 grand, the guy looked at me, uh, I, I was telling somebody, I said, I made 600 grand this year, and he's like, how do you live on that? It's I said, true. excuse me? He said, how do you live on that? How do you make sense of your like, potential at that? And w are you bragging or complaining? He's like, I'm confused. And I'm like, fucking thank you so much. See you later. I got to get back to work. Because it was a wake-up call, man. I'm like, oh, wow. What's available out there? Is that a real estate guy? Uh, that guy was actually not. He was a, he was a, he was a, a New York okay. Wall Street banker guy. You said you might have gone into Wall Street if you did, had to do it all over again. Oh, w without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. And without, I would definitely do like a hedge fund or, you know. Because it scales and there's tons of opportunity yeah, and there's things happening there. Yeah. Okay. But you went five years into sales and perfecting these techniques, and you got into real estate because you wanted a place to put your cash and put your instruments, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so the the first business was uh, the first business was me going out talking to companies. I was cold calling them businesses around America in the major cities, saying, "Hey, I have another way to sell things. I want to show it to you. I want to. Sh I just want to try it out with your staff and see what happens." And that are you that, good on the phone now? Are you getting pretty good? I'm doing, I'm doing on the phone. And you're pretty good. I'm saying I'm going to be in town. I'm coming to town. Okay. And they don't know who I am. I have no name. I hadn't written any books. I have no creds. Nothing. Okay. Hey, my name's Grant. I'm coming to town. I'd like to meet you. I'd like to show you something. I'm not interested. Click. I'd still go see the guy. So I started building. That's when I really became a salesperson. I'm 31, 31 to 33 years old. And I'm, I'm banging the phone three days. And then I show up in a city. Okay, that's what makes a salesperson because it's cold calling and then showing up. It's and a cold call the door. followed up by a visit. Hey, I was I called you the other day. You told me not to come by. Appreciate what you said. I just want to introduce myself, and the reason I'm in town, and then I'd go into my pitch, and I'm like I'm going to have an event here two weeks from now. I'm not interested. I know you're not interested. How could you be? You don't have enough information to be interested. Like that's where I learned to sell. Okay, it wasn't the five years before that. Okay, like now now I'm learning how to produce a lead how to create interest, you know, how to keep interest, how to persist in a cycle, how to hit a deadline, because every one of these events was two weeks later. Right. So but you need a deadline. I'm fun, okay, absolutely. I need a tight deadline. Right. You know, we were talking about the webinars earlier before the, the interview, and, and, and so every, I learned how to do everything in very tight timelines, where most people take, we just did an event, uh, 2,200 people showed up. We marketed the entire event for 77 days. From, start, from idea to close of event was 77 days. Nobody does that. Most people take a year to do that event. Okay. So we did a, a 9,000 person event in under nine months. Th nobody hits these kind of targets. So what I was learning, what I didn't know back at 30 years old was, I was learning about the value of time, man, and, and pressure. And that had become literally like what has made my little thing here or things, whether it's real estate, or I, I'm, I'm off track from your question. But, right, this is good. But, so but the value of time, meaning compression you, can, of time. you can get much more in there than you think. Oh my God. 
Like okay. I get more done in a day than anybody I know. All right. And by doing that, you're even much more effective. You're, well, well, yeah. I mean, your I, sales I, is more effective, and you're just compressing everything. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, time is money, right? If time is money, and I'm compressing things. So a guy told me, he's like, I said, he, he said, I said, who, who do you think works harder, me or you? He's like, oh, he, he does. He's, he's convinced he works. He works harder than any person in the world. It's right? Gary Vee. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, uh, me. I said, yeah, but, good, but who gets more done, dude? Who monetizes more faster? These are the bigger questions, not who works harder. It's who puts the branches and the pecans and the leaves in the bag without making the biggest mess. Like that, that is what a business is. It's not about making a mess or doing a bunch of work or looking all raggedy ass at the end of the day. It's how much can you get done with time, right? And so. And that's a meme gone wrong on social media. I hustle, hustle, work all the time, work all the time. It just means you're dude, out dude, there making a bunch of motions. Dude, like I don't want to hustle. I want to, I want to prosper. I don't want to grind. I want to create a machine that monetizes. You know, I'm not shameful of money. I want money. I want a lot of money. I want to give money away. I want to raise a lot of money. You can't do that if you're broke. So Poor people are selfish. They Definitely. Explain that. Poor people, you know, look, poor people are, are extremely selfish people. And the concept here is you're thinking about yourself all the time. What you don't have. What you need. Your clothing. Your shelter. Your excuses. Your problems. And I say that with no sympathy. Because sympathy's not gonna it's not gonna feed you. Okay? The the poor people and people by the way that just get by are poor. So really the thing we need to we need to define here is what is poor, right? Yeah, what Almost is everyone. Almost everyone, everyone living below your potential, you're probably poor. You're not you're not rich, you're not prosperous, you're poor. Which is the middle class of the planet. I'm not talking about poverty. You know, that guy, that guy's not poor. That guy is, he's like, he's out of choices. He's got to beg. The poor, the middle class, the described poor middle class, nice name to keep everybody civil. Mm. Um, you know, the queen's got 900 rooms over there. Oh, yeah, they've been running game here longer than anybody else. Dude, Think about it. Please. Aristocracy, please. keep people in check, limited land resources. There's a brain game going on here with your accent telling you these are the OGs of this story. Yeah. <laughs> Take note. Well, you're the Americans <laughs> are like, we can't do the class thing. If we do it, we got to get that middle class right. to feel good about themselves. And they so do they it. don't do what they did to the French chick. Right. They chop the heads off. Exactly. So they give them the cars and the over leveraged homes and yeah, they make exactly. them feel like they're rich, but they're not. Yeah. Like let's give them homes. Let's give them cars. Let's indebt them. Give them a good job. Give them a good office. You know, big watches, and, and and we got slaves. But they feel good about it because they're better off than some, you know, starving kid in Ethiopia. So that's why I say, man, the, look, the middle class is a, a group of selfish, self-absorbed, think about themselves. I'm not going to be a salesman. I'm better than that. You know, I'm a banker, dude. I'm the vice president without a job. I'm not going backwards. I'm not going to use Facebook and Instagram. I'm not going to do that to get known. I'm not going to go to that meeting. I'm not going to drive there. I got kids. This is a mother. Uh, uh, I got two kids you don't understand. Uh, I'm English. That works in America. All this is selfish bullshit. You know, it's just selfish. And you say selfish, not... It's self-centered, man. Right. What does selfish mean? It means, it means I'm interested in self. Right? And the preservation. I'm a drug addict. Okay. That's selfish. You're talking about yourself. Everything that starts with I, you know. And by the way, I am selfish. Like, like, so I'm not denying it. You guys that are fighting it, you know, you don't like me right now. You'll, you, you'll, you'll learn to like me. If you come back, you'll, you'll start getting it. You make horrible first impressions, right? I, make, I make terrible first impressions. You're making impressions. a good one on me, Grant. Well, well you're, you're, because you are who you are, though. You, you've confronted your demons. Right? You're, you're looking at your weaknesses. I've looked at my weaknesses so I can see other people's. And I don't see them as one person anymore. Like when I was 30 years old and I saw the sales process, I'm like, this is terrible for everybody. It's terrible for the user, the sales guy that's got to lie. 
not answer questions. That's lying, man. So it's terrible for the customer. Ultimately, it's going to be terrible for the industry. Slows everything down. Remember, you remember the old adage was like, the longer you spent with somebody, the better off you are. I'm like, this is stupid, dude. Not true. Why do I want to spend a long time getting a job done? Right? So, so when I saw that, I'm an observation person. Like, like I see things. I, I, my eyes are wide open. And so when I see that, I'm like, well, that's dumb. When I see me over the years say, I'm not, dude, I don't have time for Facebook, man. I, I say, oh, wait, wait, that, that Facebook thing might be that gift. I was asking for something to scale. How can I scale the planet? Facebook comes along. The first thing I say is, that's stupid. And I heard that. Okay, every time I've ever said something was dumb or stupid, meant I didn't understand it. That's code for, I don't understand it. Right. And, and, then, and then I wake up, it's like a caution light goes off in my mind and says, pay attention to that thing. And then I went and got a Facebook page. Hmm. I didn't hire somebody to give me a Facebook page. I didn't delegate it to somebody else. I went and built my own, learned how to use it, found out what was there, you know, played in that space for a little while, and then I heard about Twitter. So I'm off topic, but, but, but the point is that these are gifts, man. They're being delivered to the planet right now. Every day they're being delivered, and whoever can play the game the best and decipher between truth and like leaving that treatment center. You're never gonna make it, dude, if you do all these things. I bought that bullshit, by the way. I wouldn't write a book for 26 years. And that book was in me at 25. I should have written that book at 25. Why didn't you? The dude told me, man, leave it alone, man. I bought it. I bought it to some degree. Right, even though you told him to to fuck off. Yeah, yeah, but I bought it. It was in there somehow. And just to finish off with the middle class, they're being selfish because they're not willing to dare. They're not willing to bruise their own ego and get out of their comfort zone and actually do something. And they hide behind this thing of I'm No, poor. you're doing something. You're just not doing enough to get out of the middle class. Okay. You're doing, you're doing more than everybody. And then, and then you stop doing what's necessary. So 2008 when the economy crashed, right? That was a crash, by the way. That was a full-on depression. And anybody calls it less than that, it's not, not confronting reality. So, and, th- and there'll be another reckoning. There will be longer, deeper, and, and more harmful to more people. That, that stripped off the like, uh-oh, we're, we're in another, lull, you know, whatever we're in right now is la-la land. So, so people need to be made aware over and over. The, 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 uh, the marketplace disciplines the undisciplined. And, and, and right now people are undisciplined again. Right, and 08 just basically destroyed a lot of people's egos, took their comfort zones out of them and said, okay, how are you gonna make it through this? You yeah. gotta go deep, and you gotta see what you're gonna be made of, right? Yeah, and then 08, 08 was, for me was a game changer. Like, how so? That was the gift. That was the ultimate gift in my life. Best thing ever happened to me. And what happened? I almost had everything taken away. So 08, I guess I'd been doing business for 20 years. I'm, 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 you know, I was a millionaire many times. And, but, but I was, I got down to my last six or eight or something, man. I was like, damn, dude. Cause you had put your money in real estate. Well, what happened was the first two businesses, the, the first business was a consulting business where I gave these guys this idea about sales. Second business was a consulting business for car dealers where we went and just worked in the car industry. That's all we did. That, those two businesses, they were really hand in hand. I would do this one thing. It supported this second thing. The second business was very symbiotic to the first one. Okay. which is something I really recommend to people with starting a second business. It shouldn't be separated. It should be like hand in glove. They really should fit together. Different but, staff? Oh, different staff. Different staff, okay. But, but the first one should support. Any movement in the first one should support, like they're moving like this. Okay. You know, it's, it's almost like a flotilla. They're running together. Interesting. And then the third business was a separate business. It was basically, because these two were producing cash, I needed a third business not dependent upon my genius, my personality. And this was the first business that could run by itself. It was real. It was apartments, uh, un- unlike what you have here. You don't really have what I buy okay. in, in, in the UK. So these are large apartment complexes, 50 units, 100, 300 units, 500 units, where people rent where they live. Okay, right. Not these tall skyscrapers, because most people buy individual no, units. No, no, okay. no. That, those, are one, those are single units okay. in a big building, right, okay. that a bunch of people share. These are... These are, um, I want the renter. I don't want to sell the unit. Right. I want the, in, I want the cash flow. That was the third business. Okay. And why real estate? Why that asset class for you? You said before you only invest in things you can see. Yeah. I, you know, 
I've just always loved real estate. I think I think most people resonate. The real property resonates with people. Unfortunately, most people just buy the wrong kind of real estate. You know, they, they, again, it's a selfish decision to have a home. Okay. Most people shouldn't buy a home. No one should buy a home. Interesting. Which is the opposite of the American Homes dream. were not built for people. Homes were built for banks. The bank created that product to sell money. You can't just loan people money. You need a product in between. Like when people start really understanding what I'm telling them, they're like, wait, what did he just say? The bank can't lend money for just money. Like you need a reason to borrow money. Oh, you're starting a business. That's a reason, but it's really risky for the bank. What if a bunch of bankers sitting around drinking bourbon? Do we, we need to lend more money. We got to lend money out, man. That's how we make money. We get people to give us a dollar. We lend it out nine times. I read that book when I was a kid, man, when yeah. I was 16 years old. So we lend it out nine times. We need something to lend the money on. So back in the 50s, they're like, everybody should have a home. They grinned. Everybody should have a home, right? Oh, man, that's pretty good. That's, we should call it something like the American dream. You can't just call it a house, right? Everyone should have one, right? They got the politicians behind it. Yes, everyone should have one. And then what they did was basically those homes were built for banks because who made all the money on the homes? Wasn't even the builder. Certainly wasn't the homeowner. It was always the banks. Hmm. Hmm. Colleges was another scheme by the bank. Okay. Everyone should have a proper education. But they don't have the money for it. But they should have it. And it, it, as they offered debt, as they, as they offered free loans to college students and families, those tuitions went up. Right. So we've been sold a big old fat lie. Totally, totally. And what do people say when you tell them that? You're crushing everything they've been told their whole life. They're like, no, Grant, that's not true. I want to own my own Most home. Most people are going to write me after this interview and say, can you explain that again? <laughs> shouldn't I own my own home? No, you should never own one door. Right. And you had a horrible experience with your first yeah. single family home yeah. buy. Boy, you do. Man, nobody's done the research oh, as well as you. No one. You've been hanging no out one. with the wrong people, Grant. Probably. <laughs> So that taught you a lesson. Stay away from single family homes. I want a certain type of person with a yep. certain type of income that wants a rental property, doesn't want yep. to buy, and I'm in this asset class and I know how to do it and it works I mean, well. we could do, look, I could come here and we could do four hours on real estate. Yeah, no, I just want to just cover it. So, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because like, I don't think most people know that you're like, I do this thing. Yeah. I mean, most people never heard a real estate guy, which you're not, yeah. taught, say, don't buy a home. Yeah. I mean, that's a fascinating statement right there. Have you heard of the, the whole De Beers marketing myth around a diamond lasts forever and how they sold the whole world? No, about? no, I haven't. You should read into that because it's a similar thing. Because before in the 1920s, nobody ever gave a diamond for a wedding. Uh -huh. That's like something that wow. was manufactured wow. by the whole South African diamond industry. Yeah. And guess what? There's no secondary market. Nobody uh -huh. goes and buys a U diamond because that's, that's unethical. You will save it forever. Yeah, so they yeah. create this artificial supply sure. and demand. It's a fascinating thing, but yeah. I've never heard it talked Make, about makes sense. with homes or education. Yeah. All right, so you much see- Much bigger with homes. Okay, much bigger with homes. And so you see this, you put your money in there. Is it true you go broke twice a year? And oh, dump? Yeah. yeah. Can you explain that concept? So the, the concept is, um, you know, the, the, every business that I create is, is to produce cash flow. So if the, if the business doesn't produce positive cash flow, I'm not going to do the business. So I'm going to miss a bunch of great stuff like the Netflixes that operate on negative cash flow for years because they go raise the money. By the way, that is cash it, it, on, on the backs of somebody else. I just can't do it because okay. I know most of those things bust out the, the investors that bought the paper the stock. Another topic, and it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be devastating for millions and millions of people. See, see, people that invest in the stock market are lazy people. They're lazy and they're selfish. They just took the, the, the IRA, the, 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 the KEO, the uh, 401k, all that retirement, all the re pension funds, and all of it's just lazy, dude. And lazy is selfish. And it's lazy because they're not doing the due diligence. They're not investing in themselves. It was easy, it was easy for you. You, you, you. you just bought the ETFs. It'd be a, we're in a huge ETF bubble right now. Exchange traded futures. Okay. Yeah, exactly. With tr trillions of dollars sitting in ETFs, trillions of dollars sitting in cash. Having cash sit in a bank today is selfish, you know? So the hard thing to do, I remember my mom telling me, she's, I said, I'm gonna get in real estate. And she's like, well, why, why do you wanna do that? Because I wanna be rich. I told you when I was 16, I was gonna be rich one day and I was gonna help a lot of people. I can't help people if I can't 
take care of my own money. I can't keep speaking and going around the country and traveling forever. This real estate thing, I'm like, oh, she's like, you're going to have tenants calling you at midnight. I fucking hope so. She's like, why, would, why, why do you say that? I said, because they're calling me. They're renting from me. What you don't want is you don't want people not calling you. You know, I hope I have thousands of people calling me, tens of thousands. That would be my hope. So you see hard work and the obstacle as the way forward. And when people are doing the easy thing. Dude, when people are calling me, they're doing business with me. Okay. Like, I don't want people not calling me. Okay. I want people calling me. So it's convenient. I want people complaining. I want people to hate me. Like, at least you know me. At least you have an opinion about me. But not knowing me, not knowing me means I'm not in the game. I'm not even in the stadium. I want things to happen around me, right? So, so I started buying real estate. I bought, I bought one single family home. Six months later, sold it, realized it was a mistake. She moved out. I don't have a tenant. I'll, I'll never do that again. Blew the house out as fast as I could. Broke even. And then the next deal I would buy would be uh, 38 units then 48 units, then 92 units. I mean, now we buy, we bought 1,200 units in the last two months. Okay. So your, your question was... You go broke twice a year. Yeah. What, what I do is I accumulate cash. I don't let cash sit in the bank. This is what my mom did her entire life. She let that money my dad left sit in the bank. Maybe earned a little dividend stock. I take that money, I put it in real assets. I don't give it to New York. I know, I know that's a damn casino. Tell me about New York and Wall Streeters. <laughs> you know, come on, man. Just go visit their buildings. Go visit. All you got to do is go, go, go to Goldman Sachs, walk in the building, take the elevator up. You're you know where like, most Wall Streeters, including me, put their money? Where? We don't put it in any financial instruments. Exactly. Or stocks or bonds. Bank it's of very America. standard. Yeah, Even ba- Buffett, I think, is the same thing. Bank of America will lend me money to buy real estate, but they won't lend me money to buy their own stock. That should be a good enough indicator. <laughs> real, it's real, I can right. see it. It's a simple business. My real estate will be bigger than all my other businesses combined. It is the easiest, simplest business that I have. It is indestructible, that's the other reason. So twice a year I'm gonna go broke. I accumulate cash, once I get a certain amount, I start looking for a place for that money to go. It's gonna go into a real asset, illiquid, is good, not bad. Right. So I don't want liquidity. I okay. don't want money. Explain why illiquid's good. Illiquid. Yeah. Illiquid is good because it's in an asset. It's I don't want access to the money. You know, they say cash is king. Cash is garbage. You're cash trying to motivate yourself by getting rid of the cash. So I get you, rid of the money. To make yourself earn more cash. I have to go back into the marketplace and say who's got my money. Right. So you're like going for broke every six months. You're like, okay, guys. I'm getting ready to go broke again. How's that feel? Exciting? Well, now, now I have confidence that, that, that I can, you know. Because you've done it so many times. That I can go back and get it. Again, All right. You know? So you like the illiquid. So you're just the contrarian. You're a massive contrarian. Dude, I wish I would have bought everything in London 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what happens is, and this is true about real estate all over the world, is the people that live in the local area never change the real estate landscape. Because they're looking in the rear view mirror. They're like, I can't buy, I can't pay that, that price for it because I could have bought it years ago for less. New guy comes in town and says, shit, I'm buying it all. Right. So when I came to London, the first big win I had while I was here, I'm going back to America, I'm gonna buy everything I can. America's on sale. It's on sale, it's fucking, we're giving America away. Hmm. Some of the buildings that I'm buying right now here would be worth I mean, I'm gonna buy one deal before the end of the year. It's probably worth five or six hundred million dollars here, maybe a billion dollars. I'll pay one sixty for it there. And ten years from now, we'll, you and I'll sit down again. I'll be like, "Dude, I cracked it. <laughs> I, I cracked that building for a half a billion. I was off by half, but you like real estate because it produces income. Okay. So, and it'll produce income when I'm dead, and for your right? daughters and everybody. and for my charities. Right. So I can literally set those up to say, hey, I'm going to own that thing for 30 years or 50 years or 60 years. This real estate's been here for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Queen owns a lot of it. She's yeah. no dummy. No. Yeah. She owns a lot of that. They own, All they that Piccadilly Circus. Don't they still own India or something? I don't know. Who knows what they own, <laughs> Who knows man. about that? And you said for the first, until you get your first 100,000, invest in yourself anyways. Don't be going out and yeah, buying Yeah, first things. 100 people, people, you know, 
Look, there, there, there could be, I could change my opinion on this, right? But, okay. but people are trying to invest too soon. They're like, I got five grand, should I put it in crypto? No, you should not. You don't have any money to put risk. You, you put the five grand in you, it's no money. Like, don't think you have any money, you're broke. So invest in yourself. Just keep investing in yourself until you actually have the ability, the marketplace proves that you have the ability to produce money over and over again. Because until you know that personally, it doesn't matter what I know. The individual needs to know, I have the ability to reproduce money. Why do people save money? Because they're worried about, why do they save for a rainy day? Because they're scared. They're, they're not confident that they can make more money. Exactly, they're not confident that they can create more income and hold on to it. And in 08, you proved to yourself that you can make it through a tough market, that you can thrive in a tough market. Well, I proved, you know, what, what happened was, 08 validated that I was too vertical, that I was too one-laned, that I was too focused on one industry. Which was property in South Florida. No, at that time it was the automotive industry. Automotive. That's where okay. we were consulting mostly. Right, okay. So, um, number one, I was too focused on one vertical. I've heard guys say stay in one lane. You know, Dude, there's six lanes. You know, if this one gets blocked up, you need to use the other ones. You might have to go off-road too. You might have to jump the middle lane okay. and go the other way. So that's what 08 taught me. Go wide, go this way. Okay. And now what does that look like today? Well, today it looks like, you know, in, in eight years I produced, uh, you know, I produced more money in eight years than my entire, my entire career, a hundred times. And diversified into the consumer lane and, and all sorts of different types of products. Now we're doing corporate, consumer, we're doing multiple languages. I wrote a book in uh, called the Millionaire Booklet. I wrote that book in two hours. It was translated to 38 languages for free because of my social, my social media standing around the world. I just asked a bunch of people, can you help me? 38 languages and literally in one month the whole book was produced, written, translated. Like you need friends. Counterintuitive, 50 page pamphlet type book yeah, you're yeah, making, not yeah. the New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Another contrarian idea again again like like the book publishers you know they're they're dying they're 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 they're, they're come on man you that's, don't even, that's you, antiquated that you don't even count digital downloads like you, you, what's wrong with you guys? right so give them something they can read in a couple hours give them it took something me 19 months to write my last book because of the publisher was involved okay i'm not supposed to write a book while i'm writing a book so i wrote a booklet <laughs> okay wrote the booklet in two hours the booklet made more money in 19 days than the other book made in 19 months and was translate, translated in 38 languages. The other book that took 19 months, publishers, editors, you know, all this energy, all this wasted freaking energy and money still hasn't been translated. So speed, see, is, I'm now back to how fast can I work? Compressed time. Time is money. Most people don't, don't even understand the concept. Like, what, what does that even mean? They say it, but they don't know what it means. Yeah. Oh, it's a cute saying. It's a perfect t-shirt. But they're not actually applying it to their life. No, they're like, what does that mean, man? What does it mean time is money, right? How do you multiply time? How do you buy time? Rich people buy time. By buying jets. There you go. There, there, that's one way. I know a lot of rich people that say don't buy a jet. They're not, they're not real rich. That they're, jet, they're, they're middle class rich. Okay. But that $60 million jet will go to zero, you said. For sure. But you said. It'll go to a, it's going to go to a yard one day. But you said in the first year it made, it made it back for you because it got you more opportunities. First jet I bought was, was eight, eight and a half million dollars. I had never chartered a jet before that. I'd never been on a private jet. So all you guys out there, all you pretenders out there, you're getting on your charter and, and you just pretended for your Instagram post. It's bullshit. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not tricking anybody. First jet I ever, private jet I flew on was a used jet. I bought a used jet, um, eight and a half million dollars. I wouldn't charter a jet because I couldn't make sense of the money. This is just a different way people think. Okay. That so, looked like a waste of money to you. But the charter is a total waste of money okay. for me. Okay. Because it's going to cost me 30 grand to fly a place. I could, I could literally pay $500 and go first class. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to do it. I'm too frugal. But I'll spend eight and a half million. Now, uh, because to me, that's an investment. Charter's a show off. When you pay eight and a half million dollars and a jet sits out there and you know it's going to zero, you're gonna use that motherfucker.
And that's what you do. And so in the first, literally the first six months, we paid for that jet. How? Because it got me more places. Like when I go on a trip, I go, I, I was doing five cities in a, in a, literally in a 24 hour period. Bang, 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 seeing customers. Right. So I kept that jet two and a half years. We just sold it. At the end of the year, I bought a brand new jet. And, and I've only been on it once. And I can't wait to get on the damn thing. But, but, but that, it's a $60 million jet. Like it's right. fucking unbelievable. It gets you in front of people, which you're, you're best in front we of people. We bought that jet. We bought that jet to get, go around the world. Okay. Again, we want to go wide now. And I don't want to be just an Instagram guy. Okay. I'm not, I'm not. Explain that. Because like people, too many of those people, out there. People need contact, man. Right. You know that more than anybody. Right? I want to meet people. I, I want to see, like we, we're staying up the street, right? And people come, God, man. Hey man, thank you so much, man. I know where you're staying. I came by just to say, thank you. They don't say they like me. They say I helped them make more money. You know, I was going to buy a house and decided not to, and I bought a four-unit deal, and my God, that changed our whole life. That's what I want to hear. They probably I, like you, too. Huh? Well, I, I don't know. Okay. They, dude, I make people money. They'll like me. Yeah. That, that is the ultimate win over. You want to win people over forever? Like, we're going to open up a fund. We've, we've had three funds. I have a fourth fund we're getting ready to introduce. The reason we're doing the fund is because I know the ultimate way to make a fan is not to make a customer. It's to have them invest with you and pay them every month. Like, if you want somebody to fight for you in a bar, fucking give them money every month. So people start attacking me, they'll be like, hey, leave him alone, dude. Okay, that guy pays me and my family every month. So the point of that story is, like, you need friends around the world. I want my kids to have friends everywhere on this planet. Because it, it is still who you know. And will be for a long time. Forever. Yeah. That you, you, no, no technology will disrupt. Hey, I met him. You know, I had a drink with him. I spent time with him. We did a selfie together. Like, those things, those moments are so meaningful and rich for, for them, but also for me and my family. It's a big deal for us. So when you stop me on the street and say, hey, let's get a photo, like, I want the photo. Okay. It means a lot to you and your wife. Me, and your me, it means I am recovered. Explain that. It means, you know, it means I am valuable to society. It, is, it means the promise I made my mom that, hey, one day I'm going to be somebody is coming true. Do you ever doubt that? Well, certainly along the way. Everybody doubted it. Dude. Right. So it's just... Everybody the, doubted me. Yeah. Including me, right? Yeah. So, I, I, you know, we all need validation. It's not, that's not a lack of self-esteem that, that, that I need validation. The therapist says, you should validate yourself and you should... This is bullshit, dude. He's fucking running his bullshit on everybody. He, he is the one with the problems. So when he says you're projecting, no, no, he's projecting his bullshit, his whatever on everybody that sits across from it. So, you know, he's the one that has the issue. I, I remember sitting in front of a therapist once. He's like, hey, man, look, look your problem, your problem, bro. He's like, you're never satisfied. Yeah, no shit. I said, well, why is that a problem? Why don't we use that, man? Like Elon Musk, he's not satisfied. These guys, the guys that play at the top of the game, they're fucking geniuses. You know, they're, they're thinking about 50 things at one time. That's not a disease, man. It's a gift. Right? I got windows open all the time. I, I got a bunch of windows open while I'm sitting here talking to you. I can do that. I'm a spiritual being. I'm not limited to one window being open. You're a spiritual being. Most people would not think that about Grant Cardone. Oh, dude, number one, most important thing in my life is not my wife, not my kids, and not my business. It's me as a spiritual unit. Can you explain what that spiritual unit is? You know, it's, 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 it's what I've always wanted, man. Everything, everything from, from the, the, when I saw my dad doing the, the things in the back, the pecans and the branches, it was, it was the artist. You know, it was, it was aesthetics of work. It was probably why I frowned on some of this other stuff, the four hours and the, you know, make it easier. Dude, the spiritual being, he, 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 the fantastic, you know. Um, you know, I like the idea I created the heavens and the earth and the rivers and the lakes and the mountains and the sun and the moon and the, all the stars. And then I took a day off. I don't believe you. I don't believe you took a day off because I don't think time exists. Like, you know, you just create and create and create. So that, that's what I've always been interested in, you know, like 
Are you connecting with the divine in everything you do? Do you feel that power? When you're at your greatest, you, you know, feel I, like I, you I don't think about connecting with it. I think it is like we are that. Okay. I'm not trying to connect to something else. Okay. You're just you know? getting it from within you and letting it out. And that was your dad there on the, uh, on the backyard, and that's you when you're flowing. Yeah, but I'm always flowing. You, even okay. when it's not going, like uh, it's not flowing, right? I'm, I'm like, like, it's just part of the, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about right now, except that I'm discovering some genius and in, in, in by showing up. You know, like I discover it. Like I did this gig, I don't know, three weeks ago. When I got done with it, I was like, I said, dude, I think I tapped into some like, something really crazy, bro. Like it was like something that's going to live a long, long time piece of data I shared for three hours on finances, but it was, there was genius in it, right? But you can't have that without showing up a bunch. I think, I think Van Gogh painted like in 50 years, he painted like, I don't know, 5,000 pieces, 800 sketches, you know, uh, 700 canvases, like these crazy numbers. Like it was like he's painting two thing pieces a day. Mm. It was the frequency and quantity, you know? So if God created the heavens and the earth, I guarantee you this isn't the only one. He was spraying around a lot of stuff. And then something beautiful comes out of the experience, right? Out of the, out of the effort. And that's why some of this, I want to work part-time. I want to work from home. Dude, it's so small. And selfish. And selfish. It's little. Because you're, you're not you giving know, your greatness You're going to burn out, Grant. You're going to burn out. I've heard this, I've heard this a thousand times. You're going to burn out, dude. At this pace, you're going to burn out. I've heard that since I was 30 years old. I'm not, I'm not burnt out, you know, I'm not a candle, right? So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual being, like, you know, moving through the universe. And that's why, I like, living just in the United States and operating just in the United States and making money just in the United States is selfish, right? It's unselfish for me to write a check for $60 million, get a plane that can bring me 14 hours nonstop so I can bring my family with me. It's unselfish to do that. I could just stay home and be the big shot in, in the United States. Instead, I want to go to Beirut. We just got a gig in Beirut, and, and, and my, 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 uh, my wife's like, Beirut, I don't know, I think it could be unsafe there. Yeah, so what? We're going to Beirut. <laughs> you got to go, right? You got to go, man. Right. You got to go. Because it's uncomfortable. Whatever, we got to go everywhere. Gotta go. We got to go okay. wherever. Like, like, we have to go to people. And if not, it's just being selfish. I, I think so. Yeah. I, I think it is. Like, I'm glad I met you. We'll be friends forever. I had to come here to do this. Yeah. And so what does the next five years look like for you? You're going global. You hate that going, term. Uh, yeah, well, but I'm going global. Okay. I'm going Gulfstream. <laughs> you know, I'm going, uh, you know, what does it look like? I don't know. I think it's going to be big, though. I think I'm right on the cusp of something big, really big breaking, breaking loose for me, where we can literally make a big change. Okay in a lot of different places. What is that big change? Does that mean making more money for more people? Yeah, with, more the way, with the way people think, the way people think, the way they operate, you know, the, 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 the idea that, hey look, you know what, maybe it's not best to be the entrepreneur. Maybe it's best to work for somebody else. Okay. Like there's this whole thing, work for yourself kind of thing going on right now. I, I don't think that that's true for most people. They can't handle that. They can't no, I do think it. that's not good for them. That you're better off being in a vehicle. I got guys that work with me. They're 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 way better off being with me, right? Than than they would by themselves. Okay, so the entrepreneurship thing's overdone. Yeah, totally. Like like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do every interview by myself, dude. It's much better to do an interview with you. Right. You already have an audience, right? Like people are like, I'm gonna I'm gonna work for myself. It's dumb what you're saying. What what are you saying is so dumb? Why why do you want to do that? So I can be my own boss. Okay, so now now you're gonna hate just one person. Right now, you hate yourself and your boss. When you work for yourself, you're just going to hate you. And you're going to make less money, by the way. Worldwide, the entrepreneur makes 40 grand less, I'm sorry, $20,000 in the U.S. than if he'd worked for somebody else. On average, right? Yeah. Okay. And your business is going to die in about seven years, if you even make it that long. And by the way, again, you're selfish. Why don't you work with other people? It's a team, man. But even though you were an entrepreneur, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah, but, but for too long I was a solo. Okay. One guy, keep all the money, do all the work. 
just a personality, not, it wasn't a real business. And I felt like it, like, like there's a lot of those guys running around the planet right now. Coaches, yeah. experts, authors, you've met them. Yeah. Come in here. They're going to, they're giving business advice and they have a half a secretary. It's not a business, man. That's you being on stage every day talking about business. Tell me about social media. What's a 58 year old good old boy from Louisiana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing mastering on. social media or teaching or, you know, how, do, how does that happen, Grant? I don't know. Got me. <laughs> you know, you got me, but I did figure it out. Went with your instinct? I'm probably the, young, the oldest guy using social. I can't even believe I'm, I'm saying I'm an oldest guy, but. You are. You know, um, yeah, it was just like, dude, just like, I resisted it for a second. And Which is now a sign for you that that's something that you got to note. Always. Okay. And then when I flip, when I flip on something, and we, we have a saying in my office, if Grant does it once, he's going to do it a thousand times, 10,000 times. 10x really should be like 10,000x, but we, we knew people couldn't have it, right? So we're like, well, just, just drop the zeros. 10x is good enough. And what does 10x mean in its essence? It's a multiplier. It's okay. a, the value of multiplying. Do so, more and then do more no, again. No, multiply. multiply. Multiply what you're doing. You okay. want to multiply. You want to scale out. People are like, uh, should you scale? I've heard guys say oh, not, not everybody should scale. You shouldn't be in a business that can't scale. Nothing should be done that can't scale. You know, I want to love my wife and I want to love the planet. I want to scale my love. You know, I want to scale my family. I don't, I don't want to be confined to a wife and two kids. I want, I want millions of people in my family. My wife wants the same thing. We want billions of people to feel good about us, to support us, and we can support them. I want, I want, like literally, I want tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to invest with me. So the next five years, I mean, that's the ultimate play. The ultimate play is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge the way Wall Street steals from people. What's your reaction when you say this stuff? Do people hate you? What's they what? can't hate you anymore. When you start telling people Wall Street's stealing, the banks are stealing, the government's stealing, all these people are stealing, what do people say? Come, you know, defend yourself then. Defend yourself if I'm wrong. None of them pop up. They don't say anything. How's Grant different than, say, five years ago? Uh, Grant, 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 uh, how is he different than five years ago? Man, you asked some good questions. Um, I mean, you've evolved in a big way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's happening right now. I, you know, I used to say to myself, I wasn't, this is after I cleaned up, but I said, I don't think I'm going to have anything to say till I'm about 50. And be careful what you say to yourself, you know, because you'll make it true. So, uh, but, but, but I think that's happening. I'm figuring out my, what's true for me. You know, I'm, I'm a very, very authentic guy. I do not teach or recommend or tell anybody to do anything I don't have personal experience in. So I was doing a gig the other day and the lady started asking me about her son. I said, look, I'm not a life coach. I'm not here giving anybody advice on how to run their life. I can, I'll show you how to be successful or how I've been successful in my business. And, and, but, but I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna play in the, the, the life coach thing. I think it's dangerous. Most of the guys that are talking about it don't have a clue what they're talking about. So the next five years could be, could be big, man. How it's different than five years ago. The think is much bigger. I got a much better team. I got a much bigger team. Do you have any mentors? Uh, many mentors, many. Most of which are, well, I would call the negative mentor. What's that? The, 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 the flip side of what people think about when they say mentors. You know, I, I've looked at a number of guys that are like, okay, I don't want to do that. First thing I look for is what not to do, not what to do. So I learn more from what not to do than what to do. Just show me what not to do, what road not to go down. I'm going to get wherever I'm going. That's what the mentor does for you, tells you what not to do. No, no, I watch. I, I, watch. He doesn't tell me anything. I just watch, watch him. Like, I, I've never asked anybody, to, hey, would you be my mentor? That never works anyways. That's a surefire way to get a no. Dude, if he's got time, you don't want him to mentor you. <laughs> so, so, right. so you watch. Like, Hopefully I watch, close. I watch. And then, like, I'm, if I'm going to study a guy, I'm reading everything the guy has done. Because over his career, that guy's going to change. He's, he's going to have different data. You know, it's like Ali said, look, if, if you're saying the same things when you're 50 that you said when you were 20, then you didn't learn anything. 
So, so you want to study all their content. The, one of the problems today I see socially, particularly because of the internet, is that guys are studying so many different people. M most of which is not even study now. It's just a meme quote. It's a quote here, a quote there, a quote there. You know, one guy, one guy's respond. Oh, Fifty guys are responsible for one quote. That's what social media is. You know, it's it's awful. You don't it? like that part of it. It's it's a garbage dump. Right. I mean, it's a garbage dump. It's a great garbage dump for me, but. Because I don't, I don't watch it. I use it. It's, it. it's just distribution for me. Right. Elon Musk, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, is he a mentor in some ways? Do you watch him? Does he inspire yeah, you? Yeah, I'm a little worried he's going to bust out here, man. Sometimes I'm like, dang, I, you know, I think what? my boy's going to bust out. But How so? Because he's saying controversial things? No, just because, like, I don't know. The Tesla thing bothers me. I, I'm not that impressed with the car. Okay. Um, I mean, it goes fast. It looks good. Until you get in it, and then I'm like, I'm not that impressed. But, but dude, the guy, the guy, the way the guy thinks is massive. Like, going to Mars. See, that inspires me. Right, just going big. Yeah, going to Mars. I don't know, I don't know where it is. I kind of have an idea. I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know what's there. Fuck it, let's do it. Right? I don't even know if we can do it, but he, he's a big thinker. See, that's 10X. 10X is wherever you are. Let's say you're doing 600,000 pounds a year, and you're like, man, that was, took so much work. That guy would didn't say, I'm going to go to 6 million. I don't know how. This was a lot of work, but the think changes. When you start going 10 times, not one times or two times or three times, when you start scaling out to 10 times, the think changes. You know, the mechanism, the transportation, the people you need, the advertising, the budget, everything shifts so big that it causes you to think different. And that's what inspires me about Musk, is like, think, so enormous. Right. Rewire your brain. Throw yeah. out all your assumptions. So, like, when you were asking about the jet, all, all the guys I know that have money told me not to buy the jet. It was the guys that have a lot more money than I have that said, yeah, dude, you should definitely do it. The billionaire said, yeah, you should definitely buy a jet. Right. Because they really value their time. They, they understand what I would do with it. They're like, look, man, you got tremendous work ethic. You're very disciplined. You're not buying it to show off. You will freaking, you'll pay for that thing many times. And you make impressions in person. Better than online? Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Worse? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I got to leave that up to other people, you know. <laughs> um, well, I think I'm taller on Instagram. You're taller on Instagram. I am too, apparently. Yeah. Um, what's it like being a father? What do you learn about it every day? Unbelievable, man. You know, now you can get me all teared up, but I mean, I just, I love my kids, you know, and I'm a good father. I'm a terrible mother. I'm a great father. So I'm, a, you know, I make the time, um, you know, I, I, I push the kids. We don't give them too much. We give them enough to get a taste, you know, so, so, uh, you know, I'm a good father, man. I'm, 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 I'm available for them. I make time and, uh. You know, they're, 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 they're going to have, you know, my, 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 my oldest daughter, my nine-year-old, asked me the other day, she said, you know, your, your mother would be very proud of you. And I'm like, dang, dog, that's strong. That's proud. Uh, yeah, yeah. How old is she now? She's not. So it's getting to the age you were at when you lost yeah, your father. Yeah, exactly. That must be something yeah. to think about, exactly, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, how, totally. How do you, and then, you, you know, you were created in a crucible, Grant. Right? A fucking crucible. How, how do you mean? I don't know well, what Well, I means. mean, I don't know. I mean, the reason you are who you are today is probably because you went through this crazy time of uh -huh. death and addiction and Louisiana and mayhem. And I always wonder when people like you grow up and you have these kids and you're thinking, you know, I want to give them the best. I want to protect them and all that stuff. And I'm always wondering, do you ever think, yeah. are they going to grow up to be all they can be without, you know, without... Then they won't get any of it. They either will or they won't. They'll know, either, uh, regardless they'll, of that, will they, would they, I, you know what I'm saying. Then they're I mean, going like, to go from flying pri private to flying commercial. And right. nobody likes that shit. Right, the Buffett style. They don't get any. But I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering, do you think, you know, uh, ste you know, steel sharp and steel and that you need to have some real grit in your life? Yeah, look, look, you know, I, I, I mean, I would rather be me than them. I can tell you that. Okay. Because the, the necessity, there's nobody I'd rather be than me. Except maybe Kevin Hart. <laughs> uh, but, but I would rather be me than my kids. Just because, man, because I've made it. I've made it through the darkness, and, and, and I know how to work. And, you know, they, they, they'll, have that, they'll have that choice. You know, and they'll either do it or they won't do it. You know, the one thing that I did learn from my mother was 
no matter what my mom did. She could have done more or less, whipped me more, lectured me more. It wouldn't have changed anything. Dude, I was going down the path I was going down. And she couldn't have been any better a parent. Like, could she have done this or that different? Yeah, but it, wouldn't, it wasn't. There's only so much a parent can do. At some point, the parent, the kid's going to do what he's got to do. When we, moved to, when we moved to Miami, we live in a condo. We're on the 33rd floor. And I, told, I brought him out to the deck. There's a deck that wraps around uh, the entire place. Everybody has a, their own floor. And I brought the kids out to the deck. And I'm like, you see, this is 33 floors up, right? It's 330 feet above the ground. If you guys lean over this balcony and fall, you'll only do it one time. And it's going to hurt. It's your call. Whatever you want to do. That's your parenting style? Well, I mean, just leave, leave it yeah. up to them. They're yeah. intelligent, man. Yeah. Kids are intelligent. Yeah. You know, I've always, like, I, I, I understand it. I, I understand it. At, at a young age, I understood things. So they're not stupid. If anybody's dumb in that relationship, it's the parent, not the kid. Right. Politics ever for you? Nah, I probably. just saw it about Pro 10 minutes ago. I was like, wait a second. Probably could not, be. Man. Nah. I mean, you know, maybe this Trump thing, man, he, he, he stripped so much of it. But, see, the problem is Trump has now made the, opened the door up that I would have to compete with Rock. Okay. And his following, you know. So it's like, eh, probably not. I'd, I'd get scorched, dude. I have so much stuff online that people would use against me. Yeah, but look at Trump, man. He's just I know, bobbing and weaving. Yeah. Could be interesting. Yeah. Um, what scares you? You know, uh, what scares me, man, just not fulfilling, you know, not doing as much as I could do. You know, that scares me. You know. You still think about dying too young? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm certainly now, you know. I mean, look at 20. You're in the red zone now. You're, you're oh, yeah. older than dad by oh, now, yeah. six years. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I'm 60. So okay. um, now I'm like, okay, dude, life cycle. What can you leave now? now? Now I'm thinking about how much can I leave so that 50 years from now, somebody's studying my material. So everything that we produce in our office is all with that idea. I tell my guys all the time, dude, you, you need to start building this thing so that like the machine goes on. Yeah. I tell my wife to constantly, look, pay attention now. Long-term planning, yeah. even after you're gone. Yeah. That makes the great stuff. That makes the best stuff, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. You know? But let's face it, like, if you're not here, you're not relevant, so. It's true. Grant, I always ask people a few questions. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm ask you, if you can make a phone call to that 20-year-old Grant yeah. and give that young man a bit of advice, I guess he's right in the middle of it. Now, I always say yeah. 20. I'm not picking that because yeah. of you, but I mean... I guess you're in the addiction. Older brother just died. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That kid can't. He can't hear anything. So I'm gonna save that call. Save that dime. He can't, he can't hear anything, dude. You pound him on the. Uh, you pound him over the forehead. Won't matter. He's got to hit bottom on his own. Yeah. I mean, he's just got some time. He's gonna have to work the deal out. Do you see people. I mean, like if that? I told him anything, it would be like, dude, I'm so disappointed in you. I'd fucking hammer him with that. Yeah. Be like, so disappointed in you. You know. What a fucking shame you are. That's what he, he really needs just a, you know, you should be disgusted with you. You know, go use some more drugs. You know, just tell him, go for it, bro. You want to fucking die? You want to die with a needle in your arm? Go get it. Why, why are you taking so long? Do you see people like that now? Ever? And you're just like... Well, people don't talk to me. But I mean, I, the most I get from guys right now is, hey, man, I'm smoking weed. Do you think that's a problem? Yeah. So people, they're not really, you know. And you say, yeah, because it's going to go get worse. No, no. I say, yeah, dude, it's a problem. Because if you compete with me and you're smoking weed and I'm not, I'm going to fucking kill you, dude. In every deal, I'll kill you. Well, how do you know that, man? It makes me creative. Well, the fact that you had to take the time to go smoke the weed. I already got to fucking jump on you. Okay? The fact that you're asking means you're in doubt. I don't ask that question. The fact that you got to go to the washroom and wash it off your hands because I can smell it. That you got to put cologne on. I don't have to put cologne on. I don't have to cover anything up. You do. That's one less question I have to ask myself every day. I already got enough questions to ask, dude. There's, this, this planet's already overly competitive, right? Like, it's already hard, and then you just made it harder on yourself. The fact that you were driving... I'm, I'm at 80 clicks, I'm 80 kilometers per hour, and you're driving 80, and you smoke a little of the cushy kush right? And the next thing you know, you're going 47 kilometers, and you don't even know it. I'm still going 80, bro. 
So th those are my reasons for not smoking weed. <laughs> Second part of that question, best advice you ever received your whole life? Could have been from your mom or your yeah, dad yeah. Uh, or a mentor? Anybody? My dad, my dad told, told my mom, he didn't tell me directly, he said, tell, the, tell those boys to learn how to sell. If they can learn how to sell, they can go anywhere in the world. And my mom said, look, the best investment you'll ever make is in yourself. You can't lose that investment. Even if it doesn't work, you don't lose it. Last part to that 20 year old that's watching us out yeah, there. Yeah. It's on Instagram doing grind more, yeah, yeah, hustle, yeah, hustle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's getting all this crazy ass information now, right? Yeah. 20 years ago, they wouldn't have got that. Yeah. Do this, don't do that. It's four hour work, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what do yeah, you tell yeah. them? What advice do you give to them? Dude, get out of the stands and onto the field. Instagram is a giant stadium of spectators. Get on the field, bro. You know? The man in the arena, Theodore get, Roosevelt. Get, get in the fight. Get in the fight. It's the best place to be. It's the safest place in the arena. It's on the field. The safest place. Safest place on in the arena. Why? Because, you know, if something goes bad in that arena, dude, that field is safe. The floor, the court is the safest place in the room. Stage is the safest place in the room. Hmm. I'm going to think about that one. Grant, you are nothing like your media footprint. Oh wow! And, and you've been, and you've even said that that's your fault because you put out crazy stuff over yeah, the years. Yeah, yeah. But I guess that was just you being you. But you know, you're nothing like what a lot of people think you are. You must hear that a lot. Well, I, I, I don't know what people think I am. So, I, I, I you know, I, you know, I'm. What, in, would you think? I, you, I'm in would, the media would, business, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, I'm even in the digital product business, right? Uh -huh. And I knew a little bit about you and what you do. And I'm just like, okay, what's Grant? Is he the real estate guy? Is he the sales guy? And then this, and then the jet, and he's standing on his jet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'm like, okay, and he's over the top, but he's got the cigar. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. who is this guy? But, you know, you're you're not that guy. Yeah. You know, you're a guy. But I, but I am. But those, you are that guy. But I am those yeah, things. But you're too, not right? only that guy. That's right. But why why be only? You know, why not all those things, right? So. Everything I am, I am though. You know, I'm not trying to be a guy. I'm not. So, so I, th th at the end of the day, I'm just figuring it out too. I say it wrong half the time. You know, I know there's a better way for me to say it. I don't know why I say it wrong the first time. You know, but um, I'll figure it out, man. Shit. <laughs> Grant, on yeah. London Real, we say it's about the journey. I wish you well in yours. Yeah. I really enjoyed this a lot. Yeah. And I hope we see you again sometime. Thank you, man. I appreciate, right, sure. Thank appreciate you. you. Appreciate what you're doing. All right. London Real doesn't stop when the conversation ends. You see, that's when we get started. Because everything begins with a thought. And then comes the action. The London Real Academy is our global transformation platform. Here we bring together thousands of students from over 75 countries. Whether you want to build a profitable business from your passion, or learn to speak to inspire, or broadcast yourself with your very own podcast, or accelerate your life to become a high-performance person, we have the online accountability course and personal mentoring program that will make your dream a reality. Join us, and we'll take your life to the next level, together. Our next accelerator course is starting soon.